Kerkes. And um, the genus name Agolius actually is Latin and comes from the Greek word uh, for owl, which the word that they use is actually for a bird of ill omen. Um, for owls in general, were kind of seen as a sign of bad luck and were very much associated with things like funerals and kind of dark. Hard to say that uh, looking at this cute little guy here. And then Acadicus, actually, this uh, species name is related to where the first specimen was collected, which was in Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia falls within the region of Acadia. Um, this common name, saw wet, might sound a little interesting, um, but saw wet uh, or wetting with saw, I'm not sure what the actual verbiage would be for that, but a wetting a saw is referring to actually sharpening of a saw blade. And early naturalists likened the call of the saw wet to the sharpening of saw blades. Um, I did do a quick Google search because I wasn't sure myself what uh, sounded like to sharpen a saw. Unfortunately, most of the sound clips I found were related to horror movies. So I did not add that in here, um, but I did put in what we think is potentially the uh, uh, call that they likened uh, the saw wet to, which is the um, owl skew call. And that's what uh, this sound is. So I myself, I don't know if that is a sharpening of saw, but that is what they thought it did sound like. So these birds are fairly small. They're about eight inches tall with a wingspan of 17 inches. In non-breeding season, males will be about 2.75 ounces or 77.8 grams. And females will fall at 3.4 ounces and 94, or 95, sorry, 0.4 grams. Uh, during the breeding season, females will gain about 50% in mass. And in general, females are larger and that is the only real way to de determine male versus female uh, outside the breeding season because they're Plumage does um, stay the same between the two. So for breeding, these birds are associated with uh, the boreal forest. And as you can see here in green, the boreal forest stretches most of Canada and even to Alaska. But even though this is considered mostly a boreal species, they are found outside of the um, boreal forests. So this range map shows that they do in fact breed through most of uh, northern Canada in the boreal um, regions, but they also breed in parts of Alaska, um, New England to PA, uh, parts of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, they also be found in the highlands of North Carolina and Tennessee. Uh, they can be found breeding through scattered buttes in the western Dakotas and Nebraska, as well as uh, most of the, the western coastline as well. Um, they're mostly widespread through the um, western coastline. Um, and also uh, during their non-breeding season as well. You can find them mostly in Southern Canada, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, Midwest, and the Western Mountains. However, they will turn up in some very interesting places and you can find them anywhere, including uh, Louisiana and Northern Florida as well. And as many people have uh, found out, they do pop up in some very strange places. Uh, New York City, in fact, uh, found out, uh, I believe it was two Christmases ago now when uh, Rocky the Christmas Owl showed up in uh, the Rockefeller Christmas tree. One thing that uh, we are still trying to understand is their migration. Um, many birders strive to see this bird. Um, however, I'm sure many of you have found it very difficult to find them because they do roost during the day and they roost in very dense cover. Um, they are very hard to spot because of their um, plumage. It makes them blend in very well. They also rarely call outside of the breeding season. So locating them at night can also be difficult. And because of this, the range is hard to determine and things like migration are even harder to determine. And that has led many naturalists to really debate whether this species is migratory. Um, stepping back from that um, briefly, I will, do wanna cover a little more about the breeding, especially here in Maine, or I guess for you in Maine. Um, the Maine Bird Atlas, which is a five-year project that began in 2018 to catalog the species of breeding birds in Maine. Um, has found that the birds are found breeding um, either possible or probable, um, not confirmed necessarily throughout most of the state, even in really rural areas. Um, there are only six confirmed breeding uh, saw wets that have been detected through this. However, as I've noted, they are pretty hard to uh, detect. And uh, so it's not surprising that uh, there may be more. Um, however, uh, their breeding, they do, um, their courtship will begin in mid-March to April. They do start breeding fairly early uh, with the incubation beginning April to mid-May. 
Um, these birds do breed early with uh, sometimes even residual snow being on the ground. Um, trick burying will occur from May to June. Um, they are cavity nesters, preferring uh, holes um, created by woodpeckers, uh, specifically pileated or even northern flicker. Um, however, cavities created by tree uh, branch falls as well will also work. Uh, the habitat, they mostly are found in mixed dense forest. Um, the mixed dense providing great habitat for not only hunting, but also for um, roosting and nesting as they prefer more dense um, cover uh, for hunting and roosting and obviously needing these large trees with cavities for uh, nesting. You will find them sometimes in younger spruce fir forests as well, especially if they have the residual taller older trees that will have the cavities that they need. Um, swamp edges and shrub swamp also provide great hunting habitat and um, snags or dead trees or anything else that will provide uh, cavities will also um, lend for uh, breeding as well. Um, it can be hard um, to find exact breeding habitat. However, thankfully these birds do take well um, to nest boxes and box placement within that preferred habitat, including margins or forested areas, especially near swamps um, or dense forests and shrubs will really provide great habitat um, for them. You really just wanna avoid uh, urban areas or um, really small patches of woods because they do need a, a large enough area. Um, for hanging the boxes, um, hanging them eight to 15 feet high will provide a good location. Um, it's important to remember, of course, that you need to access these uh, for cleaning them out um, during certain times of the year. So as long as it's within reach of a ladder and safely within reach of a ladder, um, anywhere between 18 to 15 feet will be fine. Um, with the, the box, you do want to face it with the opening to the south with very few uh, obstructions. This allows for a clear flight path um, for the bird to the box. Um, additionally, uh, you don't really want to block the opening for monitoring purposes. Um, you ideally would like to be able to monitor these birds from 30 feet away and really get to appreciate them. Um, as Bill had mentioned earlier, outdoor cats are obviously a well understood issue. And so if you can avoid areas with outdoor cats or place the box on a tree that um, is not very climbable, that would be um, provide a safer area for them or even considering uh, predator guards as well. Additionally, uh, being so small, uh, these birds do fall prey to larger uh, raptors, including barred owls and great horned owls. So if you have a nesting pair or a territorial owl in the area, it's best to avoid placing a box there. Uh, if you are interested in creating a box or placing a box either on your property or somewhere you know, um, there are wonderful resources out there. Uh, Project Nest Watch through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Maine Natural History Observatory have a lot of these uh, plans and specifics about how to hang your boxes and where a good habitat would be. Um, in addition, uh, Maine Natural History Observatory it does have owl monitoring efforts and that they will go over um, a great video and they have a great document as well that will go into sort of the natural history and detail some um, specifics on where to hang your boxes as well. Um, so getting back to uh, the main focus of this um, presentation, a lot of my work has been with migration. And the reason for that is, like I said, these birds, it was really um, misunderstood whether they would migrate or not. In fact, early naturalists believe the species was mostly widespread but sedentary, which makes sense since most owls are that way. Um, however, that idea started to change and is suspected beginning in the early 1900s that these birds might actually migrate. And part of that was based on uh, two events. Um, first, in 1903, a small boat crossing Lake Huron actually encountered a small flock of these owls. And most likely, they were saw wets. So the actual quote was just a small flock of owls, or a flock of small owls, sorry. Um, the following year, in 1904, a large storm over Lake Huron caused the death of quite a few uh, thousand uh, migrating birds. And within that, some of those were saw wets. And so that began to really um, make naturalists uh, suspect that these birds are in fact migrating. They're not just uh, sort of sedentary species within their own little territories. However, this concept of migration in these birds was really debated highly up until the 1960s when targeted banding efforts began um, for these birds. Um, obviously though, without any sort of lure or anything, the capture rates were pretty low. So in the 1980s, a male advertisement call was added to uh, lure additional birds to the nets. 
Um, if you're familiar with the male advertisement call for this bird, um, I've heard it likened to the backing up of a, a trash vehicle or a dump truck. Um, you can hear it here. Very sort of monotonous uh, tooting. And I turn the ball here out that a lot. Now, with all these efforts, though, um, it was still very misunderstood what the range of these birds were. In fact, many areas and many states were concerned that these birds were either endangered or were threatened within their boundaries. In fact, in the 1990s, if you can recall, um, possibly Pennsylvania actually had a license plate with the Northern Salt Owl on that. And that was to raise awareness and to raise um, uh, efforts in order for these birds to be placed on the threatened species list in Pennsylvania. So all that interest in understanding these birds' life history led to the creation of what is called Project Alnet. Um, Project Alnet was established in 1994 as a way to better understand and add to our knowledge of these species. It is the brainchild of David Branker, who is an ecologist with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and is currently co-managed by David as well as Steve Hoy in uh, Maryland and Scott Winesall, Pennsylvania. The Ned Smith Center for Nature and the Art um, provides institutional uh, backing as well as the Penn State University Center for Environmental Imaging. And this project uh, serves as a collaborative effort to connect researchers across North America by providing standardized methodologies, capture techniques, aging and sexing resources, and analytical tools and data archiving services to really help build our knowledge and connect uh, banding stations um, to share data and uh, techniques with each other and provide a standardized protocol to um, collect standardized data on these birds. Uh, across North America, there are about 125 banding stations, uh, all run by various field technicians and a lot of volunteers. Um, each station is run by um, various organizations from nature centers to universities um, to even um, uh, Audubon Society, I'm sure somewhere I have them. Um, they're supported by various people who are very interested and very dedicated to these birds. And for the rest of this uh, presentation, I'm really going to shift focus and um, highlight the banding station that I worked at in Maine. Um, because that one is most recent for me and uh, is a very special, as you learn soon, very special location for banding solid owls. So in 2020, I accepted the role as a resident uh, bander at the uh, Petit Manon banding station. And I'm going to put it out there. I've been told that I say uh, this location wrong. I learned it as Petit Manon. Or Petit Manon. However, I was told I do not say it like a local, and uh, locals apparently say it like Petit Manan. I will switch back and forth, and I apologize. It's a bad habit to break. Um, so this location is part of the uh, Petit Manan uh, National Wildlife Refuge, which is located near a small fishing village in Millbridge, as you see in that left-hand um, map there. And it's not far from Acadia National Park, which is uh, a real treat at sunset because the cove near our banding station, you can actually see the sunset over Cadillac Mountain. And so this uh, wildlife refuge is actually part of the larger um, uh, Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge Complex and consists of more than 250 miles of coastlines and some very unique habitats. So as you can see from these photos, those diverse habitats include anywhere from coastal islands, forested headlands, estuaries, and freshwater wetlands. It's a really beautiful and secure place, or secluded place to work and a really unique place to get to experience um, at night, and especially. Um, this last photo here, as you can see, this is actually from that cove I described earlier. You can see um, in the distance a little bit, uh, Cadillac Mountain with the sun uh, setting over it. This uh, cove in particular is actually named Fair Cove. And the reason for that is on days with a lot of waves, those small rocks and boulders get picked up and rolled around and cause a loud roaring sound. And so that was uh, the namesake is uh, for Bear Cove is because of that large uh, loud sound. So on the banding station, um, this is actually a picture of where we banned. Um, this has been in place since 2015. Um, we will actually work in, out of a converted camper. Um, being a remote area, the station is converted to run off solar, to run all the lights at night. And it also uses propane to provide heat uh, 
or the, run the refrigerator and also the stove. Um, the exact hours for operation of the station will um, differ from not every uh, project Alnet station has exact protocols for when we ban. Um, this station in particular will run from dusk um, every night to about 3 a.m. bird time. And I'm going to define bird time for you uh, because we say bird time um, because birds don't observe daylight savings time. Um, bird time is essentially standard time. A standard time. So in reality, we uh, ban from dusk until 4 a.m. most nights. However, the exact uh, hours of operation are going to vary for things like weather. Um, we take great care to watch for um, wind conditions and also precipitation and flight conditions. Things like fog will uh, prevent birds sometimes from migrating, or at least um, we've noticed them coming less in our nets. And so we do watch very carefully for uh, weather conditions and that impacts our um, effort. Uh, we will not open for high winds or we might close early for high winds and rain, things like that. And like I said, this is to keep the birds safe and also on nice when we don't really expect many birds, it allows uh, us banders to get a little break um, if we're not going to be catching birds. So one of the first things that we'll do at night is um, right at dusk we open our nets. If you've ever uh, experienced a banding station before, you may be familiar with mist nets. Um, mist nets are named so uh, because they are made of a very thin material that when they're open, they almost disappear. And you can see on the right here, this, this right hand photo is actually from a different study, obviously, um, Bob Links. <laughs> Those are not solids. Um, but you can kind of see from that photo how the net, when it's open, almost disappears. And at night, you can see how that would be very difficult to see and that provides a great way to um, capture any unsuspecting owls. The picture on the left, um, those are the nets actually at Petit Manan. And currently they're in that photo rolled up or furled as we call them. And we keep them like that during the day to prevent um, birds, mammals or insects from getting captured in them while we're not monitoring them. And so Petit Manan, that station actually has nine nets in total. Uh, six of them are uh, set up in order to catch solwets and they'll be running end to end. And this is part of that solwet array that you see here. We also run an additional three nets in a separate location. The, uh, the nets that we use there are a little bit larger and are set up in order to target um, some larger birds. Uh, after opening the nets, uh, one of the fun parts of the night is to turn on the lures and we will listen to these noises throughout the night. So I'm gonna share them with you. Uh, you may, you remember the solwet call, that lovely tooth. Um, the other birds that we do target at Petit Manan are boreal owls and long-eared owls. And so you'll hear a uh, rotating, uh, the lure there will rotate between the call of the boreal owl and the call of the long-eared owl. And so that through the night, we really do hear while working on the station, a chorus of owls singing to us. And, um, at some of the stations I've worked at in places like Pennsylvania, uh, we've had some neighbors who have not always appreciated uh, hearing owls calling all night, or they just haven't realized what they were. But it is fun um, to have that uh, calling all night. So once the nets are open, uh, we'll start checking the nets regularly. Um, usually we do it about every 30 minutes to 40 minutes, um, depending on weather conditions and also how many birds we're catching. Um, the photo on the left here actually shows um, the inside of the banding station. Uh, once we start going on our runs and we encounter an owl, we will um, extract them very carefully. It takes a lot of training to understand how to pull birds out of the nets and owls, um, even these owls, as small and cute as they are, they are predators and they do have some uh, dangerous little males on there. And so we do take some extra precautions for that. Um, after extracting them, though, they do go into bird bags, and this keeps them calmer and safer while we wait to ban them. The photo here on the left is from a very busy night um, in 2020, um, which was the year that I was there. And this night, we actually had 89 birds, and so this kind of can give you an idea of what it may look like a camper full of owls. So once we start banning them or um, processing them, we'll take a bird out, and the first thing that we do is put a band on them, and these bands uh, provide um, an identification number. Each um, number is unique to that bird and is uh, gone through the um, bird banding lab, which is operated by the US Geological Survey. 
Um, the pliers that you can see there are, if you're familiar with barrier banding, they're specific to the size of the band so that the band will close perfectly and will not overlap or anything like that. And so one of our main focuses is obviously getting the band on. After that, we do take an additional um, number of measurements. Uh, obviously the weight, that's the first thing that we really wanna get. After that, we start looking at things like the wing cord, which is what you can see here. And the wing cord is the length of the um, wing. However, it's the length accounting for the natural bend that occurs. Um, we also take a modified version of the me measurement, which is called the wing flat. And it's the same measurement, but we take the curve out of the wing and we'll actually flatten it. And in addition to that, we also take things like the tail measurement and we also um, will evaluate the fat. Birds will store fat in several places. Um, one of the places that we look and usually we'll um, be able to determine um, the fat um, contents on this bird is actually in the wing pit. So within that, we'll rate that um, fat from anywhere from zero to five. And the fat's really important because obviously these birds are needing stores to make this migration. And so they'll be putting on not only weight, but especially weight and fat. And so by looking at the um, fat's a good way to tell how these birds are faring, um, especially if they're using uh, the habitat that we're banding in, um, they may be stopping over. And it's good to see if we're catching a bird over several days, if they put on fat and if they're able to use the um, habitat and it's providing good enough habitat for them to hunt and put on the fat and serve as a good stopover location. So fat can be a good indicator for not only the health of the bird, but also the health of the environment. Um, another thing that we want to do is sex these birds. And as I mentioned before, it's impossible to do so by plumage. And so the way that we do that is by actually combining that wing cord, which is that measurement of the wing that I described earlier, and combining that with weight. And we have a lovely chart that goes through. Um, genetics are used to back up the um, evaluation of weight versus wing cord to see how big the bird is and determine what the sex of it is um, as a result. There is a little bit overlap and those birds that it might be a very small female or a very large male will fall into what's the unknown category. We can't sex them, um, unfortunately. However, in a later date, if another station catches them or if we'll within the few nights that they are stopping over near the station, if we catch them again and they either lose or gain weight, it may be possible to then uh, determine the um, sex. So another really important thing that we wanna do, especially for understanding the demographics and things of uh, the population dynamics of these birds is the, um, the age. And with many birds, the way to do that is by looking at the feathers um, because molt patterns are specific to certain ages. And in um, these uh, raptors, um, these owls in particular, we will look at the flight feather um, molt. Uh, from these pictures, it can be kind of hard to see. Um, however, there are some darker feathers in there and those are gonna be the newer feathers. And so uh, from a zoomed in photo, you may be able to see a little better um, that these feathers indicated here are actually darker than the rest of them. Um, those are gonna be the newer feathers and we'll use different mole patterns in there um, to determine the age. However, um, even to the trained eye, this can be very hard to see sometimes. And um, especially with working at night with um, either very poor lighting, or in some cases, uh, people only use headlamps to do this. Uh, it can be very hard to discern these newer versus older feathers. But thankfully, um, you may not know, uh, owls actually glow in the dark as if they couldn't get cooler, they glow in the dark. Um, and this is actually a photo of that. Um, owls have a pigment called porphyrin that gets stored in the feathers and helps to create the color. Um, this porphyrin will degrade um, when exposed to sun and weather conditions. And so over time, uh, it's possible to determine the age based on the amount of porphyrin in there. And porphyrin uh, fluoresces under UVA or a black light. And so it makes it possible to really easily see sometimes um, newer versus older feathers. And so you can see here, the ones that I've highlighted are lighter in color or almost white. Those are gonna be your older feathers um, because they're limited in porphyrin. Uh, brand new feathers will have a lot more. And I'll move on to this photo here, just to give you another look of what it might look like. Um, 
Like I said, they do molt in specific ways. So the way that we'll actually determine the age is by looking for certain patterns. A uh, brand new hatch year bird, which is a bird that was hatched that year and is making its first fall migration. They will have a consistent um, feathers. They're all brand new. And so the glow will be consistent and uh, um, there'll be no real variation, no white feathers sticking out of there. A second year bird or a bird that was hatched the previous year and is now making its second fall migration will have a window in the middle. The outermost uh, flight feathers and the innermost flight feathers will be uh, bright pink and then there'll be a space of white feathers in between them. As they get older and after second year bird or a bird that we know for sure is older than two years old, uh, will have a mixture of feathers throughout. They won't have a necessary um, window that you can see. It is also possible using this black light to see up to three generations of feathers. So you can see brand new feathers, which are bright pink. Um, you'll see older feathers, which might be light pink to white. And then you'll see what we call very old feathers, which are bright white. And so that allows us to tell for sure if these birds are actually over three years old or not. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that Project Alnet has started um, back in 1994 was looking at eye color. Um, they thought that it could potentially be related to health or even um, age of the birds. And so we started collecting this and um, no patterns have been discerned. However, the more data we collect, it's always possible to eventually um, maybe identify a pattern. Uh, so we do still collect and um, evaluate the eye color. And the way we do this is actually by using this chart you can see on the left. So this uh, chart is actually a Benjamin Moore paint swatch and every banding station will use the same colors. Uh, it's a selection of bold yellow, Viking yellow, golden orchards and Oxford gold. And so we'll look at those eyes and try to compare them and discern what we think they are. And feel free to you know send into the chat what you think um, these uh, this owls eye color is uh, in reference to this uh, chart. Um, every night we'll go through a lot of these birds and we'll compare them and we end up writing down just the three uh, number code. Um, most owls I find fall either under the bold yellow or Viking yellow, um, 336 or 321. And obviously from the lighting, it may or might not be very easy to discern, um, but I would call this maybe a I would lean towards a Viking yellow, and that's my instinct, but it's hard to tell from pictures, and I couldn't tell you exactly what we called this bird at the time. Oh, I'm actually seeing some chats coming in. Oh, everyone's saying bold yellow. Yeah, a lot of the birds that we do see are bold yellow. Um, we do uh, see birds that don't sort of follow uh, this chart. Um, I don't know if you remember the first slide, but that bird was very special because the color of their eyes, his eyes was almost a uh, orange, dark orange, a pumpkin color. We've also seen birds that have a uh, closer to a green. So we don't always, or we are not always able to categorize these birds by this chart, but most of our birds, we can usually fall into some category. All right, let's see here. Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble uh, forwarding to the next um, slide. So after we put these owls through all the uh, paces and they get their new bracelets and they've gotten all their measurements, the next thing we do is get them ready to leave. Um, some of the birds look like the one on the left and they're not very happy to go. Um, they are very happy to go. They're not very happy with us, but we do take them out and we'll find um, moving them close to uh, good cover. Cause like I said before, these do tend to be uh, prey species, so we take our best care to take them to somewhere safe, and we'll give them about five minutes or so to let their eyes readjust since they are a nocturnal species. And after giving them an adjustment period, we give them a perch, and you can see on the right there, the arm is a very common perch. And some of these birds, you can't even get them set down before they are gone. <laughs> and then other birds will soon enjoy the night air, especially on extremely cold nights when I would rather be in the warm camper and but can't really be mad if you got a cute little bird sitting on your arm. So from all this data, we do start to learn a lot of things. And that's the next sort of uh, phase of this presentation. It's gonna go over some of the data that we have collected, not only to keep on, but the trends that we see across the network. Um, this graph in particular is showing the banding um, results and capture um, of saw owls at the Petit Manon station in particular. 
So you can kind of start to see certain um, patterns here. If you notice uh, 2020 and 2016 are much higher than the rest of them. And these are what we're going to call boom years. Um, these boom years uh, do occur uh, pretty regular and they're caused actually by uh, spruce cones because a year following a spruce cone crop that's very large will yield a lot of uh, a lot of rodents and especially red back voles in the breeding grounds um, and more voles tends to mean more baby owls. So on average, most um, clutch sizes will be five to six. Um, however, on a good year, it might actually uh, lean towards the higher end of almost nine. And on really good years, these birds may even nest twice and a female may have a second clutch. So on these boom years, we're seeing an influx of baby owls causing the population to skyrocket for that year, which happens about every three to five years. And because it's caused by the spruce cone crop, it is actually uh, possible to guess the following year's migration uh, based on the large or the size of the spruce cone crop, a large spruce cone crop will indicate that the following year might be a very good migration. And so 2020 and 2016 were our largest years. Um, 2020 saw uh, upwards of 458 um, new owls encountered. Um, 2021, which was last year, was uh, the year following the boom year, which does tend to be, um, it does tend to uh, drop significantly the following year. Um, and so that kind of fell where we expected it being a low to a mid year. Another pattern you can kind of see just from this data, because this is set by date. Um, our peak of migration usually happens in Maine about the first week of October. And if you can see in 2020, there's this very large jump. Um, during that we, night, we actually saw 121 owls falling right on the uh, best week for migration. And one of the things that really will um, alter the amount of birds we see will be wind direction and speed. And so that night was a perfect storm, uh, so to speak, of perfect northwest winds at a nice um, speed, not too fast, but um, not you know lacking in wind either. And that brought the owl right to us. And um, things like moonlight can also influence that as well. Too much uh, moonlight or not enough will impact potentially the flight that we also see. So another pattern that we start to look at will be the age distribution. And as I mentioned on those peak years, we tend to see a majority of the birds being hatch year, which makes sense. Hatch year being birds that were born that or hatched that year. It makes sense because on those big years, there's a influx of young owls. And so those large years, um, 2016, 2019, or 2020, a good majority of the birds we encounter will not be adult owls, but will actually be juveniles or hatch year birds making their first uh, migration in comparison. Uh, years following peak years or preceding or um, uh, prior to uh, big years will have a larger amount of adults um, versus uh, young birds. When you break that out by sex though, another interesting thing arises. Um, you can see on the left here, this is the percentage of adult and hash year birds that we see in that are female. And each year we see quite a decent number of adult female owls. Obviously during the um, larger years, we see more hatch year birds, but um, still we see a decent amount of adult birds. When you look at the male owls, there is a significant difference. We tend to see very few adult male owls. And in general, uh, you can see from this graph, we don't see very many male owls at all. Um, the light blue color there being females and the males being that orange. Um, there are a couple birds that obviously uh, fall into that unknown category that I described earlier, but well, the owls, the male owls, they're just not there. And so some of the things that um, are to be considered and been thought of are the fact that for one, we do use a male advertisement call and it would make sense if that does attract more females. However, when looking at studies that um, compare banding uh, efforts with or without a lure or with a different call besides the male call. Uh, we see a slight bias potentially to females and maybe a few more males will show up to either a passive net or a net with no lure or a net that's not using the male advertisement call necessarily. 
However, it doesn't account for the large differences that we are seeing. And so one of the things that's thought is that the um, male owls will actually stay closer to the breeding grounds. Um, as a smaller sex, it uh, makes sense that maybe they're not migrating as much because it is a taxing process. And as a smaller bird, it's a more effort for them. In addition, um, this has been described in a closely related species, the boreal owl. The males do tend to stay closer to the breeding grounds in order to get a head start in the spring and begin establishing territories and calling and um, attracting females. And so, you know, the more uh, south you get, you see fewer and fewer um, male owls, especially adult male owls. And this is something that I have personally um, experienced and uh, observed. Having worked in Pennsylvania, it was a real rare treat if we saw a male owl. In fact, I think in, I believe it was 2018, we saw not only adult male owl, but I think he was six years old. And this was the most exciting thing for us. Um, however, once I got to um, Maine, not only was it more common, but we actually saw a significant amount. Um, in fact, you'll see um, based on the data, that in 2020, we saw about 60 um, male owls, a lot more hot year, um, but that compared to the nearly uh, 290 uh, female owls that were um, encountered that year is still a significantly uh, fewer number of male owls that we do see. So one of the other things that we'll really start to look at um, is going to be the migration, obviously, which is one of the main focuses of why we do this work and banding data does uh, provide a lot of good information um, about maybe their migratory routes or their patterns and how far they're going and really indicating that range. And so we do know from the data that they do tend to follow major topographical um, features, including lakes, coastlines, and ridges. Um, they also do become loyal to migratory flyways but they do make long distance movements. As you can see here, this is a graph from Petit Manan, um, the banding station highlighted there and on the right. All those points are birds that had been banded elsewhere then recaptured at um, Petit Manan, not necessarily in the same season, but potentially between seasons. And you can see the farthest distance being from a bird that was banded in Duluth, Minnesota and then recaptured at Petit Manan. And you can see how they take these very large jumps. And part of that may be because uh, young birds tend to do weird things. Their first migration, they get blown off course or they uh, may take a different migration route the following year. However, over time it has been shown that um, owls do tend to, or these birds do tend to um, become loyal to their migratory flyways and their migratory um, pathways. Um, one of the largest jumps though um, that has been recorded was a bird that was banded in Montana and was captured the following fall, um, almost 1,864 miles away in Boston. So <laughs> they do make some crazy uh, jumps. Um, this graph is also from uh, Petit Manon. This is actually showing birds that we abandoned at our station and then were recovered uh, subsequently in other places. The green are birds that were uh, captured within the same season um, before December 31st, and then yellow being um, birds that were captured um, uh, in subsequent years. And you can see that the birds that we capture um, in uh, Maine do tend to follow the coastline and will get captured uh, subsequently in more um, southern areas along the coast. All right. So Obviously, we can't understand everything. Banding does become kind of limited. We are limited to resources, we're limited to banding stations, and we're limited to our ability to observe owls. We don't always capture them. And we, it's very, it's not rare, but um, recapture rates are pretty low. So we don't get to see how one individual travels from year to year or even within the same season. And so we really start to look towards new technologies to potentially start to get some of those answers. And one such, uh, one such technology is the modus wildlife tracking system, which um, incorporates uh, radio telemetry um, using small radio tags that are then picked up by automated receiving stations, um, not only within the US, but internationally. And these tags are pretty special because not only are they lower cost, um, which allows researchers to put a larger number of them out there, 
but they're also extremely small. And in the past, it's been very difficult to study uh, small songbirds or even saw west where it started starting to fall on that end of small for a lot of the older tracking technologies. But these new bands are very small. Um, they're even small enough to go on things such as green darner dragonflies and monarch butterflies, which is very unique to um, this sort of technology. And the hope is that within the future, we can start to see some of these um, answers to our questions that we were unable to answer in the past without um, tracking technology. So that is all I have for this presentation, but I do want to take a moment to thank all the individuals that do make this effort possible. Um, the Petit Manon Banding Station is a collaborative effort supported by the Maine Natural History Observatory, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, uh, Project Alnet, and the Maine Coastal Islands Wildlife Refuge uh, as part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. As a principal investigator, uh, David Brinker does contribute a substantial amount of his own time to running with along with seasonal technicians and a group of wonderful local and not some or some not so local volunteers as well. And um, another thank you as well to all the private donors and organizations that provide the funding to really keep the station running year to year. It would be impossible to do it without everybody else to keep it running. Thank you, Zoe. That was great. Uh, we do have a few questions. Okay. Um, one of the questions that actually I got last night, uh, 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 an early bird question, was uh, to pronounce, uh, how is the genus correctly pronounced? It's pronounced egolius. Um, looking at it, I always want to say agolius or agolius or something like that, but it's uh, egolius. Egolius. Egolius, yes. And, um, you mentioned in your description that the uh, northern sawwet is the smallest raptor in the eastern United States, eastern North Correct. America. Yes. What is what is smaller in the west? <laughs> what is smaller than a sawwet? Um, so a sawwet usually is about the weight of a blue jay, and believe it or not, there are birds that are smaller um, in terms of owls. Uh, they are larger than the pygmy owl, and they're actually two times larger than the elf owl. Right. Could you, um, I'm sorry, could you stop the screen sharing? Oh, I'm sorry, of course. So we can uh, see each other better? Great. <laughs> um, also, uh, you mentioned about flocks uh, migrating across the Great Lakes. How often are, are flocks like that observed that you're aware of and how many birds might have been observed in flocks? Um, it's hard to tell. Uh, flocks can be very large. Um, there's new technologies, especially things like radar. We're able to see that there are sometimes thousands of birds that are uh, moving all at once. Um, the use of the lakes are still being uh, studied and understood. However, we do know that birds do cross very large bodies of water. And often, unfortunately, some of our best data comes from after uh, they do encounter storms and we find them uh, dead, unfortunately. However, if anybody's been on a pelagic or even, you know, sometimes a ferry, you'll see birds coming down and using the mobile stopover site that is the boat. Um, so it is kind of common. Um, I don't know how often it is to observe because they do fly sometimes at very high heights that we may not be able to just observe. And also a lot of it does happen at night. So radar technology and things like that are still um, working to really understand how large and how frequent these flocks are. Do uh, males mate with, uh, uh, are they monogamous at all? Or do they mate with more than one female or vice versa? Um, they're not very monogamous. Um, in fact, uh, some females, uh, especially like I said, in those peak years, will have a second clutch. And often that second clutch will be with another male. Um, yeah. Before their clutch is fully fledged, they may go off and have a second clutch with another male. And so they're not monogamous season to season. Um, they're pretty short-lived birds. Um, the average recapture rate that we see or recapture age is about uh, 1.9 years. Um, however, I think the oldest bird that we have on record might be nine years and five months or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and in captivity, they can live up to 16 years. Um, but in the wild, because they are smaller, they do tend to fall prey 
And so they yeah. um, are not very long lived. And um, a lot of times they're more monogamous birds, you tend to be the longer lived right. species. Are males involved in raising the young? Yes, a lot of uh, provisioning of uh, and bringing food to the nest is really important. And they do uh, contribute that. Um, in fact, like I said, the females will sometimes, once the birds or the fledglings haven't quite fledged yet, um, but might still be dependent, they might move on to the next uh, nest already, leaving uh, the male to continue uh, providing uh, food. And uh, is there one, uh, some predators in particular that are the ones that are mainly, they mainly look out for? Yeah. That are the, um, the greatest threat? So the greatest threat do tend to be avian predators. Uh, barred owls are a huge predator and something that we do take um, a lot of precautions with in across the country and states that uh, at these stations. Um, also great horned owls as well. And even uh, something as small as an Eastern screech owl has been observed um, predating on uh, sawlets as well. Mammals too, but um, a lot of times it's uh, avian predators that they're concerned with. And the uh, luminescent feathers that you talked about and, and showed the images of, are those visible to other uh, solid owls or to other species? Yeah, for uh, luminescence. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know to what extent necessarily, but birds do see um, in different wavelengths. So it is thought that the porphyrin may appear differently, um, not necessarily the glowing pink potentially, but that they might be able to detect it um, a little better than we can with our naked eye. Right, and is there a, 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 an uh, estimation of, of what use that serves? Um, the porphyrin itself, I believe, is a recycle used in the pigment. The pigment, that brown color that um, is used in the feathers is a mixture of melanin and porphyrin. Beyond just the pigmentation, um, I don't know necessarily. Um, I know there have been studies and that's getting into uh, the visual, um, how birds perceive different uh, pigments and wavelengths. So it's hard to say whether it's something along the lines of um, age or uh, sex or anything like that, because we can't visually, based on plumage, tell the difference mm -hmm. between females. But there's possible that, you know, a bird can detect that based on the wavelengths that they can uh, right. um, see. And uh, what can you tell us about the overall population, both the size of it and health of it? Um, overall, most of the states list this bird as a species of least concern. Um, they tend to do well, however, because they do depend a lot on nesting cavities, uh, especially ones that are left by um, woodpeckers. They are subject to deforestation and habitat fragmentation. So as I mentioned with the nest box, uh, putting these in a smaller patch of forest um, does make them more susceptible to predation. And so they are really um, they are, uh, sorry, they're vulnerable to not only habitat loss, but also uh, climate change like most of our um, birds um, that we're experiencing throughout the, um, as the planet warms, a lot of their ranges are changing and altering their nesting, breeding, and migration yeah. patterns. Um, so it's something that we want to continue to watch. And in some regions, they are more um, limited in others, especially there are subspecies that um, may be limited to, um, there's a subspecies that is limited to only one island. So some of the subspecies are definitely more at risk than the um, mainland species. Yep. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It was a true pleasure. Uh, learned quite a bit <laughs> and uh, good luck with your efforts. Thank uh, you. Look, look forward to hearing more in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us.